John chapters 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5. We're going to be here until 11 o'clock. No. <laughs> So down with chapter 1, 1 John, and the second <laughs> chapter, no, the second chapter. Father, we thank and praise you tonight for your word. We pray God that you'll be with us, expound it, that you might under, we might understand it, and take knowledge to give you glory and honor of the power of this word. My little children, these things I read unto you that ye sin not. And if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. And he is the propitiation for our sins, and not for our sins only, but for also for all the sins of the whole world. One of the questions I'd like to ask is, are you 100% sure? When I look at you, I, I know you're all saved, but sometimes we need to ask that. Are you 100% sure that you're saved? If you have to say, I hope so, we're all going to wait till I get to heaven to find out. If you doubt in any way, then you're not saved. Because doubting is against God's will. You, when you accept Christ, you accept him by faith, and you believe that he saved you. You trust that the Son died on the cross. Because the Bible says here, he's a propitiation. He's the go-between. He's the chief advocate. He's our lawyer. Hereby we know that we know him, if we keep his commandments. So in order to be in line with God, the one thing I always like to say is this. In the Bible, I don't know how many times that you go through the concordance that says, keep my commandments. Obey me. Keep my commandments continually. He's doing that over and over again. He just said, if I know him and keep from all his commandments, he's a liar, and the truth is not in him. So that we, uh, when God says, don't do this, thou shalt not, all these things, and we don't obey him, we're not in line, we're not in line with what God's plan is. We're not in line with that at all. Now go go to the Verse 12 of the second chapter. I read unto you, little children, because you, your sins are forgiven for his name's sake. One of the amazing things, the how I know that I'm 100% sure, because the Bible says in Psalms 103 and verse 2 that my sins are cast as far from the east and as far from the west as you can go. And the, and the word says that never the twain shall meet. And they're cast into the deepest sea. So the, the sins are gone. I was like that we sang a song in Sunday school. Gone, gone, gone. Yes, my sins are gone. Very in the deepest sea. Yes, my sins are gone. And that's the thing that happens here in Romans, the sixth chapter, verse 12, something like this. Let that sin therefore reign in your mortal body. Who's the king? Jesus is the king. King, Jesus is living inside of you. Second Corinthians 6, 19 says, your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. So we know that Jesus is living in there. He dwells within us. So we don't want sin to reign in the body. Uh, we need, we need not, not the flesh be in control, but our spirit to be in control. And our spirit is Jesus, of course, in that. And he goes on in verse 22. Who is a liar but he that denies that Jesus is the Christ? He is the Antichrist that denies the Father and the Son. When we deny the Lord and Savior, when you deny who Jesus is, it's always the Antichrist. You're going against Christ. Whosoever denies the Son, the same hath not the Father, but he hath acknowledged the Son hath the Father. So if we proclaim the Father, we have Jesus. If we deny him, we don't have him. We're not 100% sure that we're saved. We, we don't continue in that. In verse 26, it 
of chapter 2, These things I have written on you concerning them that seduce you. Now the devil has a plan. His plan is to destroy your spirit. I always like to think in, in Luke, the third chapter, he gets a message of, of Mary. He goes down to, and he was the son of Seth, who was the son of Adam, who was the son of God. Do you realize that Adam was the son of God? He was formed out of the dust of the earth, but God made him. He's the only one, he didn't come from a woman, he came from the dust of the earth. God made him. And Adam was born perfect, son of God. He was ready to go to heaven right there. He's the type of person, he was 100% sure that he was saved. To one day in the Garden of Eden, uh, Lucifer came by to Eve and said, uh, I heard uh, God said, you're not supposed to eat of that fruit because he said, you'll die. But God doesn't know that the day that you eat of that fruit, you will not die. And she gave in. Sin reigned in her mortal body. Every time you come to that, it's like when you sin, you're doing the work of a devil. If you're jealous, you're doing the work of a devil. If you're envying, you're doing the work of the devil. Doesn't matter what sin it is, it's working for the devil. Romans 6 30 says it's like this The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. So, the devil's payday is a good payday. It's not what you want to pay. Uh, we have to realize that. But the anointing, verse 27, ye have received of him abide, abideth in you, and you need not that any man teach you, but as the same anointing teaches you in all things, and that is the truth, <coughs> is no lie. Even as it hath taught you, you shall abide in him. One well, thing that happens when we come born again, God opens our understanding to the Word of God. We read them. I know I've read this through the Bible but several times, but the one amazing thing that every time I read through it, I see something new, something great, something happens to the Word of God that changes. And you, you realize that. I've never seen that before, but you realize God opens your mind to that. In verse 28, now let the children abide in him, that when he shall appear, you shall be confident and not be ashamed before his coming. Ephesians 2, 12, something like this. Now in Christ Jesus, we are made alive in him. And the thing that happens here is, when I look at my flesh, I see, I look in the mirror and I see all these old wrinkles and doing some of my hair and my teeth and getting all crumpled up and the body's decaying and I think, wow, what a waste. But the Bible says this, when I see him, I shall be like him. Won't that be amazing? <clears throat> you stand in the presence of God in the presence of Jesus and you'll have a new body, a new shape, a new form. For if you know him, for you know that he is righteous, you know that everyone that doth righteous is born of him. Everyone that does righteousness, everyone that follows God, everyone that is obedient. The only way to be righteous is to obey his commandments. There's no other way. Chapter 3, Behold, what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us, that we should be called the Son of God. Therefore the world knoweth us not, because it knew him not. What manner of love God gave to us. Uh, I always think that, have you ever been in a place where you're lonely? <clears throat> where you feel like <clears throat> everybody's gone from you? Uh, you have no friends? Or, you can be in that position. You can be in that position position where you think that nobody cares about you. There was a fellow that wrote the Pilgrim's Progress, John Bunyan. And they put him in prison. And in the years that he was in prison, he wrote the Pilgrim's Progress. Now, I've never had the opportunity to read that book, but I'm sure it's fascinating. Paul the Apostle 
spent five years in a Roman prison before he was beheaded. And he wrote several epistles, Galatians, Ephesians, Colossians, First Thessalonians, Second Thessalonians, Timothy, and Titus. And he wrote them with love and his loneliness and the Spirit of God. Sometimes when you're alone and you're by yourself, it's probably the best time in your life that you can spend with God, that you can spend with Jesus. You become more connected. You, you become more engrossed with the love. And you realize, behold, what manner of love he has bestowed upon us. Because you feel the, the comforting that comes on you. You feel the compassion that comes upon you. You understand that God loves you. We should be called the sons of God. What a wonderful thing that is. To realize that God comes into our life and, and God and dwells within us. It's amazing. Therefore the world knoweth us not because it knew him not. Verse 2 of chapter 3. Beloved, now are we the Son of God, and it does not appear what we shall be like, but but we know that when we shall, he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. I just said, reiterated that, that uh, First Corinthians 13 says, uh, when we see him, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. When he appears, we're going to be changed. First Corinthians 15, 55 says, we're going to, uh, you go ahead and look at the very end, you, you may be disgusted what you're looking at. But first Corinthians paint a beautiful picture and says this. You shall be changed. Now put on a new body. At a moment, in a twinkling of an eye, just like that. You talk about a facelift. That's amazing. God's facelift is going to be something spectacular. And you're looking at that river and heaven, you go down and be able to see you, your figure in there, and you be able to see your, your image, and you say, wow, what a transformation. What a transformation. Oh, we're still able to look and, and act like we were before, we're still the same, but we'll be changed much better. Verse 3, uh, Gives you something to think about every man that hath this hope in him purifying himself even if he is pure. Are you ready? Are you 100% sure that you're saved? Matthew 25 says there was 10 virgins, five of wise and five of foolish. Five of them weren't pure, even as he is pure. Five of them didn't have oil in their life, they weren't ready. And God can come at any time, doesn't matter when it is, morning, noon, evening, doesn't matter, God will come, and we need to be ready. Whosoever commits sin transgressing the law, for sin is the transgression of the law. So the Bible says this, I need to examine myself and see whether there's any wicked ways in my life. I need to check myself out. I could check my stuff and go when I kneel down in that bed at night or in my closet at night before I go to bed in the morning when I wake up, it's not a little bit when it is. I need to go with that check and say, God, all encompassing, I'm a sinner. I need to pray like Paul the Apostle who says in 1 Timothy 1 15, Jesus Christ came to save the sinners. Of whom? I am the chief. I'm the worst sinner. And he goes through in first Corinthians second like first Corinthians eleven chapter I think it is where he said, I uh, I beat these people, I put them in prison, I put them in chains, I did all these things. And I and I stood there when Stephen was being stoned to death in Acts seven chapter and they held his coat. In fact, I still have his coat. I'm ashamed. I'm wearing the shame that I stood there and let someone die for the father of Christ. 
with God, and he says, God is so gracious, he's so forgiving. Whosoever abideth in him sins not, whosoever sinneth hath not seen him, neither known him. Now who, here's the one thing that you will have to present sure that you're saved, if you abide in him. Your mindset is all on God. It cancels out everything that has to do with the flesh. When flesh comes into play, the spirit overtakes it. It overrules it. Those children of no man deceive you. He that doeth righteousness is righteous, even as he is righteous. And verse 8 says, He that committeth sin is of the devil. For the devil sinneth from the beginning. For this purpose is only God was manifested, that he might destroy the works of the devil. Now the works of the devil, of course, are sin. Like I said before, doesn't matter what sin it is, it's a work of the devil. You can put that on your refrigerator door, you can put that on your board, doesn't matter where you put it, you can put it on your little mind, uh, let it trickle down to there, that every sin is a work of the devil. Doesn't matter what it is. If you, if you get mad at your wife, that's the work of the devil. If you get mad at someone at work, that's the work of the devil. Doesn't matter who it is or who they are, the devil is beginning to play into your mind. He's going to make you play into his playground. He's going to bring you in and say, let's play. I'm going to make you angry and I'm going to make you mad and I'm going to make you jealous. And then I'm going to bring it, uh, James says, every man is tempted with his own loss. And when loss is conceived, it bringeth forth sin. And when sin is finished, it brings forth death. What a waste. For God, it's the work of the devil. He, it's a progression. He works in it. He gets you to, he tempts you to do something that you should not ought to do. You being disobedient to God. You go into the act, and when you commit the act, it's done. In verse 9, whosoever is born of God doth not commit sin, for his sin remaineth in him, for his seed remaineth in him, and he cannot sin because he is born of God. You mean I can't sin? Well, no. Jesus rules and reigns in your heart, and you won't let sin come forth. That seed remains in you. It's planted in good ground. You've got to bring forth food a hundredfold, fiftyfold, so forth, so forth, like that. <clears throat> Verse 10, and this the children of God are manifested in the children of the devil. Whosoever does not righteousness is not of God, neither, neither he that loveth not his brother. One of the amazing things is love. To love our neighbor as ourselves. To love one another, to lay you down, lay your life down for your friends or so forth. Uh, love is the, the most amazing thing that can happen in our life. For this message that he heard from the beginning, that we should love one another. I love First John because it talks all about love. It, it gets to gets rid of the wicked thought, get rid of the evil thoughts. When you get mad at somebody, just think of that. I'm supposed to love them. When you don't want to, when they do something with it, you don't want to forgive them. Remember, you have to love them. That's another what it is. I've done that a couple of times. I went to this person's house and said, Will you forgive me? She said, no. Of course, God dealt with her. And so many times we, we get into that situation. In verse 14, we know that we have passed from death into life because we love the brother, and he that loveth not his brother abideth in death. <clears throat> There's no exceptions. There's no go between, nothing. He that does not love his brother, you can't sit on this side of the aisle and look over there and say, oh, I gotta avoid her this morning. She said something nasty to me. I have that over in Glen Risky, this lady, I don't know what it is about her, but she's just antagonist, antagonistic. <laughs> to, put, to put the small word, she said things that just 
makes you mad. And she's sort of like a digger. She wants to dig in there and, and start an argument. But I love her to death because she's a faithful person that comes to church every Sunday. But the thing that I'm not gonna say, I, I, I don't know, I can't stand that lady. If you come home from church and you say to your wife or your husband, I can't stand that person. There's something wrong there, something missing. He that does not love is not of God. Remember, Jesus never stopped loving you. He never stops loving us. Lo, I am with you even unto the end of the world. I'll never stop loving you. On the cross, he said, Father, forgive them for they don't know what they do. Even his enemies, he loved them. They're there. Hereby we perceive that we love God because he laid down his life for us and we ought to lay down our lives for our brother. Verse 18, my little children, let us not love in word, neither in tongue, but in deed and truth. Be honest about your love, don't say, well, I like you, but in the back of your mind, you don't like them. <laughs> uh, sort of like you're saying you love somebody, in the back of your mind, you don't, you don't really love them, you don't really care. It's sort of like saying, I care about you, I love you, I'm praying for you, but you really don't care for them. Sometimes you wish they were dead. It comes into, the devil comes into play like that. So we, hereby we know that we, that we are of the truth, in verse 19. And shall assure our hearts before him. Now in chapter 4, First John. Beloved, believe not every spirit, but try the spirits whether they are of God, because many false prophets are gone into the world. Jesus is inside of us. He lives there. The Holy Spirit indwells. The Bible says the Holy Spirit indwells within us. We have an anointing in him. But the devil comes into play in first in first second seven two says the mystery of iniquity does already work. Only he will lack because he be taken away. Then shall that wicked one be destroyed, whom the Lord should destroy with the with his sword of his mouth and the brightness of his coming. God is gonna destroy that devil, he's gonna put him away, put him out of our life. Hereby we know that. Here, verse 20, hereby I know you the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is of God. Every spirit, every spirit is each one of us. Each individual, God puts that in the category of each one of you, each disciple, doesn't matter who you were, every spirit, and every spirit is inclusively of each one of us. There's no exception. Everyone that's born again comes into play here. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come to Christ is of God. So we praise him, we give him glory, we give him honor, we don't ashamed him, we don't deny him, we proclaim him, and we witness to save other souls because we with him or heaven. Verse 3, and every spirit that confesses not that Jesus has come in the place is not of God, and this is that spirit of the Antichrist, whereof we have heard that it should come, even thou already is in the world. With all this woke stuff, and all this stuff over in Europe, where they're trying to get all the nations to come together, we've got to all be one, put all our money into one basket, we'll have all one kind of money. That's coming to the day of the Antichrist. In Revelation 11, chapter, where it says they're going to receive the mark of the beast, 666. You won't be able to buy or sell or do anything without that mark. It's coming into play like that. Ye are God, little children, and have overcome them, because greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. I love that verse. I realize that I'm, I'm magnified by that person that. The Spirit of God is so 
great. To me, the devil is just a small little guy standing beside Jesus. He's not able to overcome Jesus. No way, no how. When we have the Spirit of God, when we have that power, that resilience in our life, that Jesus is greater than the devil. There's no question about that. In the wilderness, the devil comes to him and says, all this will I give unto you if you fall down and worship me. And Jesus, of course, said, it is written, thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shall thou serve. Greater is he that is in you than he who is in the world. You hear about uh, and in verse 5, they are of the world, therefore speak they of the world, and the world heareth them. The ministry of the gospel can be changed. I uh, always think that, uh, like First Timothy 4, it says, preach the word. The instant in season and out of season, reprove, rebuke, and exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. What did he say? Preach the word. We don't want to hear some philosophy sermon or some category like that, some how do I live a how do I live a great life? How do I prosper? How do I do this? How do I do that? You want to hear the word of God. And people want to hear the word preached. I like to sit in the congregation when I was when I wasn't a preacher, and I would like to hear the preacher preach the word, the word of God, and nothing else. Hereby is our love perfect, perfected in verse 17 of chapter 4, that we have boldness in the day of judgment because as he is, so are we in the world. As he is, so are we. What power! Jesus said this, I, I'm going away, but I, I want you to know the greater works that you do than I do, because I'm going to heaven. Greater works. Greater person. In verse 18, there is no fear in love. A perfect love cast aside fear, because fear has torment, and he that feareth is not made perfect in love. Do you fear death? Hebrews 9, 27, the point of the man went to die, and after this is judgment, we fear that. We understand that every one of us has had, had a physical birthday. We know when our birthday is. But you, do you know when the day that you were saved? I know exactly the day that I was saved. 1972, on the 6th of January. I'll never forget it. I was baptized when I was 12, and I thought I was really saved, but I wasn't really saved. I really didn't know what I was doing. But I remember my spiritual day. And I remember, I'm thinking of John, the third chapter, I'm knowing Nicodemus. He's remembering his spiritual day. I know the thief on the cross. Said, Father, remember me when you go into your kingdom. I know he's remembering his spiritual day. I know Paul the Apostle is remembering his spiritual birthday on the road to Damascus. What a change God can bring. Well, understanding that is, there is no fear in love in Jesus. We can put that in there. There is no fear in Jesus. Perfect love cast aside. Now, if you have doubt, Here's the problem. Two things work together, doubt and fear. I know, you know what the Bible says that you have faith and vain and must proceed. You say to the younger tree or young, young Vermont be moved into the sea and it will be done. But it won't be done if you doubt. The Bible says in Luke, the 11th chapter, verse 24, it says, Ask and you shall receive. Wow. Thank you, Jesus. But I ask, and I doubt. I question myself. You know, I've often stood in the funeral home and the well was laying in the casket, and I wanted to go over there and lay my hand on there and say, Arise. 
you think that wouldn't happen. It won't happen because you've got, you, you, feel, you feel like a fool. You don't want to go there and make an idiot out of yourself. That's the thing that you think about, you doubt. But if you didn't doubt, and you didn't fear that God wouldn't answer your prayer, it would be happening. And so we doubt, and that because fear has torment. Torment is like this. We're praying, and it's not happening. Uh, uh, preacher, I thought I asked you to pray for that person, and nothing's happening. Uh, fear has torment, and you feel you feel like you're not you're not into God. God's not hearing you, but He is hearing you. The disciples came down from the mountain, and Jesus healed this lunatic. And the disciples said to Jesus, "Why could we not do this?" And he said, "This kind was out not except by fasting and prayer, being into God, getting rid of that." Getting into God, getting rid of that doubt, spending hours in prayer and praying to God, and God comes into your life and He changes it, and the fear goes out of your life. He that fears is not made perfect in love. In other words, I'm not 100% sure because I don't know whether I'm saved or not. I hope I'm saved. When I get there, I hope that He says to me, Well done, my good and faithful servant. Well, what's happened to me? Fear, he that fears is not made perfect. I'm doubting what God says. God says, I'm, I sent my son to save you. John 3 16, whomsoever will. I sent my son to save you. And if you doubt that, your love is not made perfect. And the way to be 100% sure that you're saved is to make sure that you don't doubt. We question. Even when we pray, we, we question our prayers. And, oh, I don't know whether God's listening or not, but it does happen. We love him because he first loved God. God. If any man says, I love God and hate his brother, he is a liar. For he that loveth not his brother whom he has seen, how can he love God whom he has not seen? And this commandment have we from him, that we should love God. Love his brother also. The commandment again is to love one another to keep his commandments. In chapter 5, Whosoever believeth that Jesus Christ is born of God, and everyone that loveth him that is begotten, loveth him also that is begotten of him. We know that we love the children of God when we love God and keep his commandments. Again, we're going back to that statement that we need to obey, keep your commandments. And John says in verse 3, For this is the love of God that we keep your commandments, and his commandments are not, are not, what? Grievous. You mean I got to do that? You mean I got to love that person? I don't know how I'm going to do that, God. You mean I gotta forgive that person? I don't know how I'm gonna do that, God. I just don't understand it. I mean, I can't be kind to that person. I have a fellow come to me one day and he said he was, uh, his battery was gone in his car and he needed to go to work. He had no way. So I took the battery out of my car and put it in his car. He drove it downtown and stopped at the bar. But I still forgive him. I still understand that. I have people that I gave money to over at McDonald's, and when they drove away, they were waving cans of beer at me. But I still forgive them. His commandments are not grievous. You love without exception. Well, I love you if you do that. If you love like that. If you put the cap back on the toothpaste, I'll love you. If you pick up the socks off the floor, I'll love you. If you do this, if you smile at me and you're kind, I'll love you then. The grumpiest person that you ever said, I'm going to lay down and shop the same one Sunday night, one Saturday, I'm going to shop and I'm sure 
I know she had a bucket of nails for breakfast. She, she was mean to the cashier. Cashier and I said something to her, and she just blurred off of me with a few little poor little words. And I thought, oh, baby, please. I love her. And these commandments are not grievous. For whosoever is born of God overcometh the world. And this is a work of victory that we overcome, he that come overcome the whole world, even our faith. Who is he that overcometh the world but he that believeth that Jesus is the Christ? Well, then we need to be overcomers and not underachievers. Overcomers are overcoming every sin, every trial, or every temptation that comes our way. Under Achievers are the, whole, are the ones that the Bible says when they sowed that seed, they fell on rocky ground and they fell on thorns and they rose up and choked them. And when temptation and persecution come along, they gave up. They were underachievers, didn't live for God. When persecution comes your way, when temptation comes your way, doesn't matter what it is, we need to be overcomers. Greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. So when you suffer persecution, just remember that. You need to be that overcomer, because if you're not an overcomer, you're an underachiever. When persecution comes in and you give up and you quit, look out. And finally, verse 6, it says, And this is he, this is he that came by water and blood, even Jesus Christ. Not by water only, but by the water and the Spirit. And it is the Spirit that beareth witness, because the Spirit is true. Verse 8, and These are the three that bear witness in the earth, the Spirit, the water, and the blood, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. We have all access to each one of them. We go to the Father, to our Father, in Jesus' name. We go to Jesus in Jesus' name. We have the Holy Spirit. I don't know about you, but I have him every day. He speaks to me every day. He guides me in me. That's a, that still small voice. Jesus said to Nicodemus, the spirit that I'm talking about is like this. You see the you see the wind blowing, you see the trees moving. You hear the sound of it, but you don't see it. And the Holy Spirit is like that. It's all encompassing. It's everywhere. It's all around you. Father God, we thank and praise you tonight for your word. Thank you for your presence. Thank you for the Holy Spirit that we become overcomers and not underachievers. Who we might go through persecution and tribulation and understand that you love us. That we might love one another in faith and truth. In Christ's name, amen.